Hey guys, it's your favorite reliability test guy here with another action-packed, fun-filled video on reliability tests and validation topics. This current video is on... Ah, dang it. There goes a the small fortune. Well, this current video is on drop testing. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you do, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel. Let's get started. In this video, we will go over an introduction to drop and tumble testing. How portable products, systems, packages, and whatever else people screw up and drop are tested. In this video, we will cover definitions, drop and tumble test planning, drop testing preparation tips, and tumble testing preparation. Below is a high-level summary that defines the development and test cycle process for requirements to test reported and test results. In this video, we will cover a component of the test procedure step for specific types of testing, drop and tumble. So what is drop testing? A quick personal story on this, as many of us have had the horrible, horrible experience with our smartphones dropping and coming to its demise or looking absolutely awful after dropping. So I had bought an absurdly expensive smartphone, and as you know, these little pieces of junk are more expensive than a gaming laptop these days. And I had bought a name brand, top of the line, protective case for this should be stored in Fort Knox overpriced smartphone. The issue with this top of the line military grade bomb it to oblivion and it will live on phone case is that it impacted the inductive or wireless charging for my smartphone. The piece of junk even advertised it would work with wireless chargers. But that was a half-truth, which, you know, never happens with marketing teams. They would never provide a half-truth and word it in such a way that the company doesn't get sued. No, that never happens. With this Kevlar lead-plated, apocalypse-ready smartphone case, you had to place the phone with microscopic nanometer precision on the wireless phone charger or it would not be able to charge. To make matters worse, it was like winning the lottery to get the phone to continue to charge on a wireless car charger for an entire trip with this vibranium-constructed, battle-armor-ready phone cover. Anyways, I took the case off after three months of utter frustration, and of course, within two months, I ended up dropping the phone, which never happened when I had that forged with Asgardian Uru rare metal, super expensive phone case installed on the phone. And needless to say, my insanely expensive pocket supercomputer received the kiss of death from that cover glass angel of death known as Black Asphalt. Of course, the probability of survival of any smartphone is incredibly low when dropped on asphalt, concrete, sidewalks, and other gritty hard surfaces that take the lives of numerous smartphones or at least their cover glasses on a daily basis. Unless you have a Nokia, which lacks features and most functionality of its competitors, but can take the worst beatings and abuse like a husband 20 years into his married life. However, this video will cover strategies used by top companies for ensuring the most robust smartphone that they can possibly produce, if that brings you any comfort. So what is drop testing? Let's start with a blah 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 definition. Drop testing simulates accidental release of a portable product or system resulting in a fall and impact event with various ground surfaces from varying heights. We talked about smartphones initially, but drop testing is also performed on things such as packaging and items shipped along with portable military systems. Pictured is a system I proudly worked on and its predecessor during the early part of my illustrious career. I mentioned various ground surfaces. Let's discuss a few of the common ones that, are, that can torture or lightly tickle that device you are using to graciously watch my video, which is incredible, I know. So we have carpet, wood, steel, granite, and concrete as some of the major examples of things you can drop your poor little smartphone onto and waste a thousand dollars or more in a heartbeat if you're an idiot like me and spent that much on a phone 
So let's go ahead and discuss drop and tumble test planning. So the first thing is you want to determine the guideline standard or test procedure that you will use and the type of test you want to perform. You might want to perform free fall or drop testing or random tumble testing. Either one is fine or you can run both together for a really good time. Some of the standards used include MIL standard, IEC, or ISTA. And believe it or not, with some laptops and smartphones, they actually test to MIL standards so that they can say it is MIL standard certified. So you also need to determine the reason for your testing. Is this for certification? Is this safety abuse? Are you trying to do a reliability test? Or is this for verification and validation? You should at least have the last two as part of your testing strategy, reliability and a verification and validation drop test plan. You also need to define what your test surface is for your testing. You might use several of these or all of these. So a typical surface used for a hard surface is steel, also wood, and particle board. So why particle board? Particle board gives you a nice envelope for all sorts of different carpet surfaces. It's kind of a worst case scenario for carpet surfaces. And also granite, which is a good coverage of tiled and hard floor surfaces. You also need to determine what your test height is. Typically, it's between 25 millimeters. Uh, that could be for bench handling or for super heavy equipment. What bench handling, I mean, is drop damage or drop stress that is induced from a operator or assembler handling the product on a bench. And it can also go all the way up to two meters for your drop height, which is very common with some shipping and military standards. You also need to define the number of drops, the faces that you will drop on, edges and corners if applicable, or the number of cycles or rotations if you're doing tumble testing. You also need to figure out the method of release, how you will drop the product in the case of a free fall drop test. So determining the equipment selection will be driven by the method of release you want to use for the test. And we'll cover that in a later slide. So let's go ahead and cover some drop testing preparation tips. Precision. So I highly recommend you use a level or an angle gauge to determine that you are completely parallel with the surface you want to drop against or to make sure you are at the correct angle for the corner or edge you want to drop against on a surface. So you have your level here and your wonderful little digital angle gauge as examples of hardware or equipment you can use to verify. Next you want to determine your test specimen release strategy. Do you want to use a free fall or an impact type strategy? And it, it all depends on what type of product you use. And you can basically use all of this equipment for either packaging or for a handheld consumer product. So the first design you see there is a trap door design. And as the name applies, it drops out the floor from the product or box you're testing and allows it to hit the test surface that you're, you are using for your testing. Another example here is a impact drop tester, which has forks which drop down into a channel and allows the package or product you are testing to impact your test surface. Now let's go ahead and check out a video of my favorite type of drop tester for consumer handheld electronics. This video features yours truly. Yes, I am a celebrity other than on YouTube, believe it or not. Reliability equals customer trust. If you give a customer a great user experience and a quality product, the customer will always come back for more products from your company. So, we have a drop so notice the pneumatic grips that your device goes into. Notice the pneumatic grips that your device is held with. This allows you to have a controlled, true freefall drop. You'll notice 
that the pneumatic grips release the device right before it hits the rubber stops. So you get that true free fall drop and it is controlled so that you can have a repeatable test at the same test location that you want to repeat a test on. As you can see, I used to be pretty fat, but that was before I performed over a million drop tests, which allowed me to drop my weight and become the sexy beast I am today. So let's cover some test surfaces that are used for drop testing. As we had, some of these look familiar from what we had just discussed. So here you see steel, wood, particle board, and granite. You can use one of these or you can use all of these, whatever you feel like and whatever works best for your product. So that's up to you to determine what surface you want to use for your testing. If you would like help with uh, developing your drop testing and what surfaces to use for your particular product and you're not sure, go ahead and reach out to me in one of the links below and I can help you out with that. So you also want to use a type of measurement device for your drop testing, whether that's a ruler with things like bench handling or very low drop height type tests, which you would typically do with heavier products. You have your meter or yardstick, which you would use for your typical drop. Uh, just a quick side note, just about every major company that sells portable consumer products has done t numerous studies and surveys and determined that the optimal height that a product needs to survive is a one meter drop. So you will see at a lot of different companies that they part of their validation strategy will be to pass a test at a one meter drop height. So then you also have a tape measure, which is used for your much, much higher drop heights, but you could also use it for as a replacement for your ruler or your meter stick if you just happen not to have one laying around. Keep in mind, if you're doing any kind of certification or military type testing, you want to make sure that you are using a calibrated ruler, yardstick, meter stick, or tape measure. So you will actually have to send one of these things to a calibration house or your in-house metrology department to have it calibrated in order to be in compliance. So keep that in mind. Believe it or not, all measurement devices, including your handy-dandy household ruler, need to be calibrated. So let's go ahead and discuss the last topic here, cables and harnessing. If your company or yourself have determined that the highest probability of drop will occur with the product's cables or harnessing attached, you will need to develop your test setup so that the cables or harnessing does not catch your product and affect the free fall drop. So you don't want to use a cable or harness as a bungee cord or some kind of a acceleration damper to prevent your product from hitting the surface at the max acceleration possible. So keep that in mind to make sure you have enough slack in your cable or harness and to make sure that it doesn't affect your free fall drop. I've done this kind of testing before. It is a pain and you can end up not having repeatable testing depending on the size, position, and weight of your cables or harnessing. So keep that in mind and put some thought into your test setup when using cables and harnessing. Let's discuss a few more pointers here when preparing for drop testing. Number one, perform an early verification test using incremented stress steps. What is meant is start at a lower height and work your way up to a height at which point your test specimen fails. Repeat at that failure height to confirm it was not fatigue failure and boom, you know your design margin for your drop test for your product. Don't wait until you have hard tooling and are too deep into a product life cycle to determine the design margin for your product for different conditions and stresses. Understand your design and don't rely 100% on virtual test simulations or you will end up in a world of hurt. I have seen numerous instances in my career where it was assumed that virtual testing provided 100% confidence of how a product will behave in the physical world. And time and time again, clever companies trying to cut costs had to learn the hard way. 
I'm not knocking or talking down on the importance of virtual testing here. Virtual testing is a very important tool to speed up development, design learnings, and efficiency. However, don't try to replace physical testing with virtual testing, or you will pay the price later down the road, especially if you wait until you have significant money dumped into your production tool and before you decide to get around to confirmation of virtual testing results via physical testing. I digress here. Let's get to item number two. Ensure that you include a pre-drop test and a post-drop test inspection and or test to your test procedure. Do not wait until you have completed drop testing on a test specimen to make sure it has not failed. You won't know where it failed and you just wasted a whole lot of time by not including a pre and post test. Item number three. Some standards, especially shipping standards such as ISTA, have a preconditioning requirement for packaging testing prior to mechanical tests, usually in the form of a temperature or humidity soak. Check to see if preconditioning is a requirement for your product or your package. Item number four, you want to make sure your test is repeatable, especially if you are trying to replicate failure modes. It can be a real pain to hit the exact spot on a device, especially corners and edges. So make sure you prepare your setup and document the steps for that particular setup in case you need to repeat the same test again in the future. Item number five. It is always a good idea to video record your test, especially fast mechanical tests such as drop. The reason for this is that you may be able to capture a failure event as it happens. It is also your evidence that you ran the test correctly as the first thing design engineers do when their junk design fails is blame the guy running the test for not doing it correctly. So cover your bases and also give yourself an extra piece of data for your test results package. You can even link any videos or interesting features or events in your test report or failure analysis report. Hands down, the best setup for use for recording is a high-speed camera. These things are awesome, and the frame rate allows you to capture some amazing carnage in action from drop testing. However, like smartphones these days, they require an American Express black card to purchase one of these cameras. So this might not be the way to go for money-conscious companies. So a digital camera or your overpriced smartphone will do just fine for recording drop tests in most instances. Let's go over some tumble test preparation tips now. But before we do, check out this really cool commercial from a few years back that shows a type of event that tumble testing can simulate. I just wanted to share that video with you. I was part of the team that helped film that video, which was a major commercial on major TV networks. So that's pretty cool. I know I'm awesome. Let's go ahead and get to item number one here. Typically surfaces used are steel or wood, but it can be whatever you want as many tumble testers have bolt on impact surfaces, which allows you to create whatever kind of impact surface you want. Refer to your company's specification or test standard that you are using as your guideline if you are unsure what surface you need to use. Item number two, determine the number of cycles or tumbles depending on what you are testing and what the requirements are. It could be anything from five tumbles to thousands of tumbles. Item number three, for the tumble tester equipment, what most manufacturers offer is similar. So the key things to look out for is the drop height as you can get options that have a quarter meter, half a meter, one meter, but I'm sure you could get any size drop height you want from the right manufacturer willing to customize and if you are willing to pay the premium for custom equipment. You could build your own in a pinch. I've seen this done. 
but it could be more trouble than it's worth. But I don't know your yours or your company situation, labor force, and so forth, so that judgment call is for you to make. Tumble testers are awesome for company, family, open house days. Or take your kid to work days, as it will give your kids or your co-workers' kids the ride of a lifetime, as good as any ride you can find at a carnival. I'm just kidding. Don't do that. But have you seen some of the carnival rides out there? Throwing your kids into a tumble tester isn't any sketchier than some of the high acceleration rust buckets I see people getting flung around on at carnivals these days. Item number four. You need to consider a step sequence for your tumble cycles to allow for a checkpoint and determine what number of cycles you want to complete before stopping to inspect and test operation of the test specimen you are tumbling. Just as we discussed with drop testing earlier, depending on the cost and fragility of your product, you should think about whether you want to perform a step stress starting at a lower tumble height and working your way up to your final tumble height. Item number five reiterates the step sequence point in item number four because I think it's really important. But I want to emphasize that you need to have a check in place to check for degradation or hard failures and you pr as you progress through the tumble test so that you know at which point your product failed or began to have degradation. Item number six, just as we mentioned with drop, to really get a good test result that anyone can physically see, video record your test and when possible as you may catch a failure in action and or eliminate finger pointing or blame game fests. Item number seven, if you are attempting to perform the tumble test with cabling or harness and attached to the test specimen, depending on the length of the cable or harness, you may have to cut the cable or use a representative pigtail. For the length of the pigtail, refer to your company's specification or the test standard you are using as the guideline for creating your test procedure. A common length I've seen is 100 millimeters used for the pigtail length, but I've also seen it vary from this size as well. The key takeaways from this video are Number one, determine the test standard or equipment for your product. Number two, determine the test surface or surfaces you will use for drop and tumble testing. Number three, make sure you have all the necessary supporting equipment such as rulers, levels, angle gauges, and so forth. Number four, depending on the shape, size, and type of your product you are drop testing, will determine which drop tester to purchase. However, you can use any of the drop testers we reviewed for any product with a little creativity. However, some are more painful to use than others for certain products. So select your equipment wisely unless you have no choice and the equipment's already there and you have to use it. Number five, record your drop and tumble testing if possible. It's video evidence of any potential failure modes and verification of how you set up and ran the tests. If you need help with your drop testing, feel free to reach out to me in one of the links below. Thank you for watching this video. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to reach out to me at one of the links below. Thanks for watching and have a great day.